Here is an example of an inference test. Um, so in this case, we have a major car manufacturer wants to test new engines to determine whether it meets new air pollution standards. The mean emissions of all engines of this type must be less than 20 parts per million of carbon. 10 engines are manufactured for testing services, and the emission levels of each are determined. The data in parts per million are listed below. So here's our data. At the 5% level of significance, do the data provide sufficient evidence to allow the manufacturer to conclude that this type of engine meets the pollution standards? So one thing I notice in this problem is that it is, in fact, a hypothesis test. Um, what clues me into the fact that it's a hypothesis test is this statement here, do the data supply sufficient evidence? Um, So that actually says to us that it's a hypothesis test because it's asking us to make a decision. Um, the next thing to figure out is what parameter are we looking at? And so one of the things I look for is specific words. In this case, I actually see the word mean. So that tells me I'm dealing with the parameter of mean. Um, the next thing to figure out is to state a random variable, and in this case, the mean in words. So we have to figure out what it is that we actually um, measured and then we have to figure out what parameter, in this case, we know the parameters means. So looking at this, we want to test our new engines to see if it meets the air pollution standards. The mean emission levels of all engines have to be a certain thing. Um, and emission levels of each were determined. So it looks like our random variable is the emission level, emissions of new engines. It actually should say levels here, so let's stick the word level in. Um, you want to be as exact as you can be in these. So we will say that the X is actually the emission level of a new engine. Again, our parameter is the mean emissions level of a new engine. And the symbol for mean is the Greek letter mu. Um, I did end up writing out some of this by, um, by ahead of time because it takes a long time to write all this. So you'll see some of this is written and some of it will write now. The next step of every hypothesis test is to write the hypotheses. There are two hypotheses. There's an HO, which is a null hypothesis, and there's the HA, which is the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is the one we're trying to actually prove. It's what we actually want to show um, or have support for. HO is what we assume to be true. So let's see what we're trying to prove or show. Um, the mean emission level of all engines of this type must be less than 20 parts per million. So that tells me right there that less than tells me that we're trying to see if the mean emission level is less than 20 parts per million. Um, our HO is, looks exactly the same as the HA except that it has an equal sign in it instead of the inequality. I do want to point out that these two numbers here should always be the same. One of the mistakes I see a lot is people put different numbers here. Um, the next thing you should also point out is what significance level you are testing. So going back here, we look for our level of significance. It's right here. And so in this case, our alpha level is 0.05. All right. Now that we've stated our hypotheses, the next step is to state and check the assumptions. Um, a mistake that's usually made is people don't actually state them, they just went ahead and checked them. So we're going to state them first. Um, because this is a test for the means, it has two assumptions. One is, is that we have a random sample was taken. And the other one is that the population of a random variable is normally distributed. So looking at this, we do want to state this in terms of the problem. So we had a random sample of emission levels of 10 new engines was taken. Um, you will notice that I did actually specify in my random variable that it was the new engines because that's the ones we're dealing with. And so I basically just stated what it was. Um, now we have to see if we actually did take a random sample. Um, if you look back at the problem, you'll see it doesn't actually state anywhere. In fact, what it does say is it says 10 engines are manufactured for testing purposes. So the manufacturer could, in fact, have manufactured them to be really, really good. 
um, most likely they went ahead and manufactured them based off of um, the specs that they want to build with. So my guess is that they probably went ahead and have a representative sample. It may not be random, but it probably was good enough. But do realize that this assumption may not be true if they just randomly did them the way they wanted. Or not randomly, but just made them the way they wanted and made them a little bit better. All right, the next assumption is that the population of all new emission levels for the new engines is normally distributed. Again, you want to state that in terms of the problem. So the population is the emission levels, and it's all of them for all the new engines. And we do want it to be normally distributed. The problem doesn't state whether or not it is. We also don't have a very large sample, so we can't use that it. it has to be greater than 30. So we have to actually do the assessments for normality. So remember that is where you look at a normal probability plot, which is this one here. And you look to see, do you have a line that you could draw through these dots? And the dots kind of fall along that line. So if I were to think about drawing a line through these dots, um, I'm a lousy drawer of lines, obviously, but I get kind of the general trend of a straight line. Um, you can also look at a histogram. I prefer to look at the normal probability plot, but you can also look at a histogram. Um, this histogram looks very nicely bell-shaped. There are only 10 engines, so it's kind of hard to say. Um, there were no outliers, so if you did the test for outliers, you'd see there's no outliers. So it does appear that this population is normally distributed. So it looks like our assumptions are okay, except for maybe we don't actually have an, a random sample. All right. So now we're at the next step of every hypothesis test, which is to create a... Um, the test statistic and the p-value, this is kind of the important piece. This is kind of where the cool stuff happens. So one of the first things you need to do is you need to find your sample mean and your sample standard deviation. Um, I would use technology to find those. I wouldn't find those by hand, the formulas. So using technology, I found out that the sample mean is 17.17. And I find that the sample standard deviation is 2.98. Um, because we don't know the population standard deviation, this is a t-test, which means we use the t-distribution. The formula for the t is your sample mean minus your population mean over your standard deviation over the square root of n. As a reminder, n was 10. So, we have 17.17. We want to subtract off the population mean. But we don't know what that is. That's why we're doing this test. And that's where HO comes into play. So this HO, we are assuming the mean is, in fact, 20. So we are going to actually be able to put 20 into this formula for the mean because we are going to assume that that is what it is. And we're going to see, based on that assumption, if we end up with something that can't possibly happen or is unlikely to happen, I should say. So now you take out your handy-dandy calculator and you calculate this and you find out you get negative 3.003. The question is, is that unusual? So to determine unusual, we actually do something called a p-value. Um, our p-value depends on what HA is. Our HA in this example, going back, just to look at it one more time, is that mu is less than 20. So that means that our p-value will be the probability of getting a t less than the t we just calculated. So this symbol right here in your, um, in your p-value should be the same as your ha. So whatever ha is should be that symbol there. So if your ha is less than, then you'd have a less than. If your ha is greater than, you'd have a greater than. Not equal to is a little weirder because that means you have to do a less than and a greater than. Um, you will use technology to find this p-value. You actually can't find it any other way. You can find approximations with tables, but that's kind of old school. So we will, in fact, use technology. Um, if you happen to be using the TI-83 or 84, you would use the TCDF in the distro menu. Um, if you're using the um, um, R or some other program, statistical program, then you could find it through that method. And we 
always I need to put in the lower limit because we are less than. Our lower limit is negative 1 e99. Our upper limit is this number we calculated. And then the other thing you need is something called the degrees of freedom. For a one sample t-test, which is this because we only had one sample, it had 10 numbers in it, but it was one sample, the degrees of freedom is always n minus 1. So in this case, it would be 10 minus 1 or 9. Um, the reason for the degrees of freedom is the t distribution changes its shape based off of what your degrees of freedom are. So you type that into your calculator or into whatever technology you're using, and you come up with 0 0.0074. So that's your p-value, and that tells you if you got an unusual number based on this 20, or if you got some number that wouldn't be that unusual to get. And that gets us to our conclusion. If your p-value is small, and what we defined as being small, going back again to our first step, or actually in this case our second step, this alpha level, that alpha level is our definition of unusual. If we're smaller than that, then we've got an unusual thing to happen based off assuming that mu is actually equal to 20. Um, since we're not that unlucky to get unusual things when this is true, we can now reject that HO is, was true. Um, in this case, we were less. So we would say since the p-value is less than the alpha, you're going to reject HO. Alright. Now the last thing is to actually write this in terms of what people would understand and not just what you understand. So our last step is the interpretation. This is where you tell people what you actually did. So at the 5% level, because that was our level of significance, um, because we were able to reject HO, we actually have enough evidence to prove HA. So there is enough evidence. to support what HA had to say. Now let's go look at what HA had to say again so we can write this in the terminology. So one more time back to the front page. Um, HA said that mu was less than 20 parts per million and we define mu to be the mean emission levels of the new engine. So we can now go back here and we can now say that there is enough evidence to support um, that the mean emission level of the new engine is less than 20 parts per million. So that's good. We've met the federal standards. We're all good. And we can go ahead and manufacture this engine. And we're done.